if you guys will, let's stand and begin to worship together. Before you now, the greatness of your renown. I have heard of the majesty and wonder of you, King of Heaven, in humility. I bow as your love and way. Peace. 
and the grave is over. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when He calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God. Fall on my knees and rise. You may be seated. What a glorious thing it is to worship a God who is such a conqueror, that he is more powerful than anything we face, than anything that's coming at us, that we know that we're, he's just walking alongside us through all of it, a lot of times walking in front of us, right? Amen. And it is great to see you guys here. We're happy to have you on this chilly day. And for those of you joining us online in the nice warm uh, homes that you're in, we are glad to have you as well. But we do have some things going on here that we want to make sure you know about. So if I can turn your attention to the screens, we'll check it out. Oh, I'm so glad you brought the tea. I, I um, yes, I brought the. Oh, don't spill it now. Right. Perfect. <laughs> Hello. Now it's such a pleasure you could have joined us today, Miss Hilda. Thank you. Thank now, you. I tried to make this as I normally do, but it's a bit chunky. I like it that way. So, have you heard any goings-on at the church recently? Well, I think there's uh, something called Faith in Action. Ooh, yes. Faith in Action, huh? Some, uh, some, I, I think it's, um, January 31st. Oh, oh, that's lovely. That's just lovely. That's the day when we go out and and they, they do the projects, the service projects all across Santa Rosa. <laughs> We go out and we're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We we, we help the community, dear. Oh, it's, it's a, I it's love a the time. community. It's a lovely time. We go out and we, 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 we stretch our legs. Right. So I'm going to make sure that uh, Leroy signs up in the atrium this week so we can get on a project. Oh, he should call Wayne. Wayne, Wayne would love to work with him. Oh, uh, lovely. You know what I heard? Hmm. <coughs> Do tell gossip. Ooh. I heard that the marriage conference is coming up. <gasps> yes. Are you gonna go to that, dear? Uh, Leroy and I could use it. It's gonna be on the twelfth and the thirteenth of February. That's a Friday yes. and a Saturday. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes, a two-day event. Two days. I'll have to check my schedule with Wayne. It's called Finding Our Happy Place. Marriage can be chaotic, <coughs> as you know. As we know, marriage can be a chaotic place. We've been in it for uh, 63 oh, years. It'll be mine and Wayne's 65th. Oh. Oh. But the marriage conference is for everybody. Whether everybody. they've been married for 65 years or 65 days. Either way, you should come to the marriage conference because it's a lovely, lovely event. Um, I think it's Staff Appreciation Month. Oh, really? Staff but, Appreciation but, Month? But darling, not until February. Oh, that's good. I've got time to find a gift for them. Yes. All of the staff, whether they work in children's or youth or our adult education or wherever the staff works. What? Why did you just eat that honey? Is it for your cholesterol? Yes, I was. Uh, my blood sugar was dropping. All right. I'm excited to see what SPR has planned. More details to come yes. soon, right? Uh, <laughs> yes. How did you get all this information, by the way? Were you connected with them on their their a Facebook page? Ah, oh, their Instagram. Oh, is that that's where the Twitters are? Yes, and the YouTubers. Ah. Yes. Yes. The video. Well, this has been awful. I love that. 
Hilda. So, same time next week? Yes, with different tea. Absolutely. I will see you next week. All Don't right. touch me. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. Y'all pray for Darcy and Hilda, or whatever their names are. They need help. Um, we want to uh, share a couple of things. Speaking of prayers, um, right in the seat backs near you somewhere, there's this little prayer slip. If you would like to write out a prayer, uh, a prayer request for us, you can drop it in the offering basket as you're leaving here in just a few moments. Just drop it in there, and we'll be glad to pray for you. Uh, that's one way you can let us know how we can pray for you. Another way, there are these QR codes somewhere near you. Just uh, you know, take a picture of that QR code. It'll give you a link to several things, including how you can let us know about a prayer request that comes in to our staff so we can pray for you as we meet together. You can also uh, check in. You can uh, check out the sermon notes for today. And you can also give online. And if you brought an offering with you, we haven't passed the offering baskets in, gosh, 10 months now. So <clears throat> our giving has been either online giving or it's been from people who bring an offering. They just drop it in the basket as they are leaving. And uh, I just want to tell you, thank you, Thank you to all who have helped to so generously uh, keep the ministries of the church going. 2020 was a challenging year for ministry. We were doing a lot of things that were, we've never done before and, our, and ways we've never done them before. And uh, you helped to make sure that nothing went undone and helped grow some ministry. So thank you for your generosity and thank you for your continued support as we enter a brand new year. Uh, we want to share with you a uh, prayer request. Uh, one in particular, Miss Sue Russell. Uh, Sue, this is um, uh, Stevens and Caitlin's and uh, Cammie's and Jeff's mom. Uh, lift up all of them. Sue has been in the hospital. She is uh, in the process. She's been in intensive care uh, with uh, pneumonia and COVID. She is in the process of getting out of intensive care. Her sense of humor is back, and she is doing much better and improving. And, uh, but continue to pray for Sue as uh, she is in the hospital. Um, and pray for the whole family as they're concerned about her. Um, I debated on whether or not to talk about something, but you know me, I, I don't usually back down from stuff, so I'm not going to do it today. A um, couple of things I want to share with you. First of all, the, what happened this past week at the Capitol building was reprehensible. Um, and uh, that was nowhere near uh, how things should be handled uh, and how things should be done in our nation. So what happened there was reprehensible. Uh, and everybody's blaming everybody else. And, uh, you know, we're, there's, the truth is there's enough blame to go around for everybody. So uh, we, that's not helpful. Where we are today is a divided nation. And all the blaming and all the name-calling and all that kind of stuff is not going to help how, us to bring healing here. And we need healing in our nation now. Now, I want to share with you, I don't know if you ever pay attention to the, uh, when you're singing the song and the words up on the screen. The words up on the screen, you'll notice that nothing is capitalized except words that pertain to God or to Christ. Nothing. I mean, you, if you notice Daniel, David, and Moses' name, they were, those were all lowercase. We, that's an intentional thing we've been doing for a while. And you'll notice it hopefully even more as you're uh, singing along and watching, following along. The reason everything is, ca is a small case except for references to God and to Christ is that's our focus in worship is God and, and worshiping Him. So we capitalize that to make it stand out. That's why we do that. And so since we do that there, uh, it reminds us, and every time I look up there and I see that, it can remind us of our focus. And I will tell you now, I believe that our nation needs to be refocused and not on a party and not on a politician but refocus back on the Lord. That's where we're hurting. You know that scripture, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and the last thing is turn from their wicked ways. Those are prerequisites for God to heal the land. Now, if we expect for healing to come, it's not going to happen outside Hoping, uh, outside of the faith, hoping it happens somewhere else. I believe true healing can only come when we refocus as a nation on the Lord on, uh, who helped to found this nation. 
Uh, you know, and so I would, I would invite you to spend some time in prayer doing that. And let me give you a little helpful advice. Uh, I, I don't know when you get on Twitter or you watch the news or you, or you uh, get on Facebook or wherever it is you may be getting, and you start reading and hearing all of this stuff and I don't, you know, that's going on and, and all the, the turmoil and everything and the anxiety level starts going up and the anger and all that. Let me give you some free advice. Cut that junk off. It is not helpful. You don't need to be that update, updated to the point where it causes you anxiety and it causes you stress. No, no matter what political persuasion you may be, it's not worth it. Guess what? You watching it is not changing anything except making you more miserable. So I want to invite you to do something. Whenever you feel that anxiety coming or when you feel that excitement coming, Either way, I want to invite you to refocus that. Instead of going through all of that, refocus that by focusing it on prayer for our nation and for a revival to sweep this land. Listen, revival is not going to come from outside. It's not going to come from outside of the Christ followers. You can't revive something you never had. Revival comes within each Christ follower, and it spreads out. And because of revival, it brings others into the faith. We need to refocus. Refocus our hearts. Refocus our thoughts. And we need to pray for this nation. So I'm going to be down here praying for this nation. And I've noticed there's plenty of room around this altar if you'd like to join me. Will you? Let's pray together. Father, we come before you right now with thanksgiving. We thank you, God, that you are with us always. We thank you for the hope that we find in you always. We thank you for the help that is ours because of you. We thank you that you have never let us down. You have never forsaken us. You have never turned your back on us, even when we've turned our back on you. So, Father, we give you thanks for your steadfastness and your faithfulness. We pray for those on our prayer list like Sue and any others that are on our prayer list that need a healing touch from you. We pray for that healing to come and you would work in the lives of each one of these individuals, Father, that we pray for. Father, we also come before you right now praying for this nation. We pray for the division that is rampant in this nation. And we pray for healing to take place here, Lord. But we know what your word says has been made very clear. Healing will only come when we repent and turn from our evil ways. When we repent of trying to make it on our own. And we realize we can't make it without you. So, Father, I pray as a nation that you would work in this great nation. Lord, I, I pray that you would bring healing. I pray, God, that the division would be healed, Father. And I pray that our focus would get off of politics. Our focus would get off of any of that other kind of stuff, Father. And that our focus would come back to you. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And I pray, God, that we would not forget that. You are not confined by a county boundary or a state boundary or a national boundary. You are all. So we pray, Heavenly Father, for healing. And Lord, I pray for each Christ follower that you would revive us and revive us, Lord. That you would revive our hearts and our minds and our thoughts and our, and, and our lives. And I pray that we would refocus on you. We would remember where our true hope is. And we would share that hope and that love with the world that needs to hear it. Lord, we know that revival begins in our hearts and can spread into our community and through this world. But God, we pray for that revival to come. 
we give you thanks for never giving up on us and being there for us. You are the first and the greatest giver, and we pause today to give you thanks. For it is in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in our service. Fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high? in every low Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know now is everything you think of me in you I find my worth in you I find my identity Ooh, and you say I am loved when I ourselves so well, but you know us so much better, Lord. You have given us gifts and abilities that we don't even understand. And Father, you have also given us your supernatural and amazing strength. Lord, this world, just we just feel like sometimes it just tries to just 
beat all of that strength and all that confidence and faith out of us. But Lord, you have a never ending supply. And Lord, when we just come to you and we just lay everything at your feet, Lord, you'll just fill us back up. And we're so grateful for that. And Father, we thank you so much for the, the reminder through worship and through the word that, that you've put on our pastor's heart today. And just ask, Lord, that you would be with him as he brings the word. Father, let every single heart that is, that is going to hear this, Father, just be transformed renewed, refreshed, and emboldened. We love you, Lord, and we give you all the glory in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Before I preach, I want to share a couple of thank yous out there. Uh, first, I, I want to thank the staff and all, the, and Sam especially, and all the hard work that they put into putting together the service for the um, the December the 27th online only service they worked really hard and I was so proud a lot of them really got out of their comfort zone by speaking <laughs> and so I was so proud of them and I really appreciate that I also appreciate Brenda's message last week about dreaming again and um, I got a chance to listen in and join in online as we were away but uh, I just appreciate that and, and how the team just stepped in and, and do, they always step in and do so much and I want to thank you I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to start another brand new year here with y'all in ministry. And uh, we are, Anita and I are excited about what, what we have in store for this year. And um, uh, I want to share, today is a standalone sermon. Usually I do series, but today's a standalone, Reclaiming Surrendered Ground. I'm going to do a two-sermon series starting next week. And the title of that sermon, that series is Peace on Earth. And actually, it's about depression. How we deal with it, what, you know, what it's about, how we as Christ followers can help and, and deal with that. So if you, some of you may deal with that on a regular basis, and some of you may know of others who do. I was really impacted by a message I heard in September, and I wanted to share with you uh, some thoughts about that over the next two weeks. If you know of someone struggling, invite them to come and be a part of that as we talk about that over peace on earth the next two weeks after today. But today, we're talking about reclaiming surrendered ground. In the future, I'm, gonna, I'm working on a series, uh, maybe next year, about reclaiming surrendered ground. But this is all on its own this, today. So, um, I've never had the honor to serve, but I've got a daughter who has served. I've got a son who is serving and a son in love who is serving. And all three of them have been deployed, so I have a high respect for the, the military, always have. And I have a lot of friends who are in the military. Now, since I've never served, I've never had the experience of going into battle. But I've talked to people who have. And in a military campaign, the goal is not just killing or being, or being killed. <laughs> or keeping from being killed. That's not the goal. You see, they are fighting, whenever our, our, our soldiers go into battle, they are fighting with a particular mission that they need to accomplish. That, com that mission could be a whole lot of things. It could be to conquer a particular area. It could be reconnaissance. It could be to rescue someone. It could be to destroy an enemy stronghold or a base or supply line or something like that. There's a whole host of reasons or missions that are out there. But the objective is the mission, not just to kill bad guys. That's the objective, is the mission. And when soldiers fight, they encounter some resistance that uh, sometimes may outnumber them. And it may seem like they're facing overwhelming odds. And there's going to come a time when they're facing those odds that the soldiers, are going, the soldiers, the leaders, are going to have to make a critical decision. Do they continue fighting or do they retreat and surrender the ground that they have already captured? And if they surrender the ground, another decision has to be made. Are they going to try to reclaim surrendered ground, regroup and go back and get the ground back? I'm reminded of a man who went all over town and he'd go up to men all over town. He'd, he'd walk straight up to them. He'd ask them their name. And they'd tell him his, you know, if he didn't know them, they'd tell him his, their name. And he said, I got a list of people I can whip, and you're on that list. He'd write their name down. And, it, you know, the people in town, they kind of got used to him. They thought he was a little kind of crazy, and they'd get used, they got used to him. He'd go up to a man. I got your name on my list of men I can whip. 
Well, a stranger was in town one day, and this man walked up to the stranger. He said, stranger, what's your name? The guy gave him his name. He said, I'm putting you down on my list. And the stranger said, what's that list? He said, this is a list of men I can whip. And then he walked off, and the stranger started thinking. That was strange. And then he got mad. He can't whip me. I know he can't whip me. And what I don't know. And then he starts chasing the guy. He, he goes and gets to the guy. He said, Hey, you put me down on your list as somebody you can whip. He said, I sure did. He said, You can't whip me. And the guy that with the list, he said, You don't think I can whip you? And the guy said, No. He said, All right, I'm taking you off my list. <laughs> you know, Christ followers. Uh, let me stop right here. If you're not yet a Christ follower, most of this message is not really for you. I invite you to listen in if you're online or in here. If you're not accepted Christ yet, I invite you to listen in on kind of a little family meeting. But I'm going to be talking to us Christ followers a lot today. So Christ followers, our trouble is that we give up too easy. We're like the man with the list. We just write things off. We, we give up too easy. In our world, too many Christ followers have looked at our mission, which is to bring the gospel to the world. We've looked at our mission that we have been given. And unfortunately, far too many of us have decided to surrender ground to the enemy. And if you haven't, I want to make sure we're clear on who the enemy is. The enemy is Satan. The enemy is the devil. And anytime you hear me use the word enemy in this message, that's who I'm talking about. See, we've gotten to the point of where we think that the battle is either too hard or the enemy is too strong or the risk is not worth the effort. So we have allowed the enemy to keep the ground that we have given up. And let's be honest. We have surrendered ground in all areas of our lives. A few examples. We've surrendered ground in our spiritual lives. See, instead of preparing for battle against an enemy who wants to destroy us, too many Christ followers have decided that reading the Bible and praying and being consistent in worship and serving in, uh, is too much to deal with. And I'm talking about Christ followers everywhere. Instead of putting in the effort to get to know God better and get to love Him more, we, we have become complacent with keeping enough ground to sit on and giving up all the rest to the enemy. Paul knew that Christ followers were going to have trouble and want to, change, want, want to go their own way and do their own thing. He even wrote a, several letters about that. And he wrote a letter to a young minister by the name of Timothy. He wrote two of them. In one of those letters to Timothy, he was warning Timothy of what was going to happen. Notice what he says to young Timothy. He said, for the time will come when they, talking about the people in the church, those who are supposed to be following Jesus, for the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. We surrendered so much ground. Because people, you know, people are showing up in churches all over the world. They're showing up in churches wanting to hear what they want to hear, not wanting to hear the truth. And because we've become so worried about offending people or so worried about them actually getting upset because they've heard the truth of what the Scripture teaches, our, we've surrendered so much ground that denominations are ordaining pastors who don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, who don't believe in the virgin birth, who don't believe in the resurrection. Boy, Easter must really be boring for them. 
I mean, the, I, could, I, could tell, I could introduce you to some. We, we, have, we, have, we have a crop of pastors coming along that don't, that, that what they want to do is they want to redefine sin because they think God got it wrong when he defined it. Listen, if me or any other pastor you listen to ever starts trying to tell you that God doesn't mean what God says, that God got it wrong, or that we need to relook at what God said, you need to fire me and you need to fire anybody else who says that. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give you a heads up. You ain't going to have to worry about that with me. I mean, you're not. Listen, listen. What we have, we've surrendered so much ground is that that we have pastors. They're more worried about offending someone by preaching the truth of Scripture than they are by offending God by watering down what He's already said. Let me ask you something. Why do you teach your children not to touch a hot stove? I mean, shouldn't they be able to decide for themselves whether or not that's a good idea? Shouldn't they go through that experience? I mean, why would you curb their creativity? Why would you curb their adventuresome spirit? Why would you tell them that it is bad to touch a hot stove? Why? Why are you being so cruel to those children who need to express themselves. Do you know why? Because you are the parent, and you know because you've touched a hot stove, and you've been burned by it. You know that you're not hindering your child from experiencing good things. You're keeping them from harm. God is the heavenly parent, and God has already defined sin, and the reason he says things are wrong is not because he wants to mess with your fun. It's because he knows it's destructive in your life, and he is telling you not to do it. If you don't want to listen to God, don't make your children listen to you. I mean, if you get a pass, why shouldn't they? Whoa. You see, we have churches and pastors today. We have churches and pastors who would rather allow people to be in sin and to die and go to hell than to tell them, those same people, that there is salvation in Jesus Christ and that he will forgive them and he will release the bondage that that sin has on them. And let's face it, we have people showing up at church. They don't want to hear about their sin. They don't want to hear about what's wrong. They just want some, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay kind of stuff. If any preacher starts preaching, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, fire them. Cut them off. Don't listen to them. We surrendered ground in our marriage. In our marriages, we've given up too much. There are too many who have said that the effort to have a strong marriage is too much work, and they can just trade in their current spouse on an updated model next. You know what's wrong with that? I mean, there's more than I can get into. But one of the things that's wrong with that is this. When you trade in your model for our new model, you're not getting rid of your problems. You're carrying your same problems in with your new spouse. You know why? Because you're still in the marriage. You're still there. Trading out don't work. You're still there. I mean, see, you got to put in the hard work. And marriage can be hard work. Just ask my wife. She knows how hard it is. Listen, y'all have put up with me less than 10 years. She's put up with me close to four decades. The woman is a saint. (laughs) I ain't even get an amen out of my wife today. All right. I mean, she is. Listen, and we we have told you. I've told you standing here, it has not been easy. I've told you how the troubles we've gone through. 
I've told you how close we've come to not being together. I've told you. I've told you about us being in counseling. Listen, we've given up ground in our marriages. We've given up ground in parenting. There are far too many parents who are trying to be their children's friend and not be their children's parent. Let me tell you. You can be their friend when they're grown. God's called on you to be their parent now. Kids aren't going to like it. It's not going to be easy. Oh, well. It's your responsibility and your calling to do that if you're a parent. We've given up. We've surrendered ground in our church connection. Too many people have become content to be weekend attenders and have chosen to not get connected and to not serve. They have, their mantra is the mantra that has been around for thousands of years. Somebody else can do it. We've given up too much ground in our society. We've surrendered so much ground in our society that it's difficult for me to even try to talk about it because there's so much we've surrendered. I can't get into all of it, but I'm going to get into some of it. There are too many Christ followers. We've sat back and we've allowed society to dictate what is right and what is wrong instead of listening to God telling us what is right and what is wrong. We've gotten to the point where we are more worried about being politically correct than we are being spiritually correct. I played with the idea of rewriting the Lord's Prayer in a politically correct version. I couldn't get through it. I just started out with the first phrase and I couldn't couldn't make it. Our father, mother, heavenly parent, non-binary individual who might be up there higher power. Did I miss something in our politically correct world? I mean, we, we have gotten to that point. We've gotten to the point where we're so worried about being politically correct that we have given up on being spiritually correct. We sat back, let's, let me give you an example. We've sat back as Christ followers, we have sat back and we've allowed a group like the Wisconsin-based Freedom From Religion Foundation to bully people with threats of lawsuits if local municipalities like Jay has a nativity scene on public property or if Pensacola doesn't take down the Bayview Cross. We've allowed them to just bully us around. We've thrown out God's definition of marriage and we've allowed the courts to change what God settled in the Garden of Eden. I don't know who quoted this. I'm attributing it to the famous anonymous because I don't know who said it. But I love it. It says, God isn't going to rewrite the Bible just for your generation. His word remains the same always and forever. You'll find who said that. I'll give it, I'll attribute it to them. We have sat back as Christ followers, and we sat back, and by our silence, we have endorsed and improved the murder of hundreds of thousands of unborn babies every year. That's not a popular stance to take. I didn't come to be popular, I come to be correct and faithful. As Christ followers, we sat down, and every year, every year, we condone the murder of almost a million babies. Every year. Since 1973. Figure out that number. We've elected politicians that not only believe in abortion, but they believe in abortion up till birth. Day of. How many of you have ever heard of the Senate Bill S-311? Go to Senate.gov. You can look it up. It was voted on and passed last February, February 25th to be exact. The Senate Bill S-311, let me tell you what it is. It is the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. 
And this Senate bill, it states that a baby who survives an abortion should get the same care as a baby born naturally. Let me ask you something. Shouldn't that have been a 100 to nothing vote? Right? It wasn't. Forty-one senators, including our soon-to-be vice president, voted against saving a baby that survived an abortion. Their vote of 41 senators, their vote was that you take the baby that survived the abortion, you put it over here on this metal table and let it die. That was their vote. You can look it up. If you can't find the link, I'll give it to you. I've got it right here in my notes. See, we've surrendered so much ground that we have a congressman who opened Congress with a prayer that was addressed to God, Brahma, and a host of other gods. And then he closed the prayer by saying, Amen and a woman. And he was an or- he's an ordained minister. He thinks he's woke, but the truth is he's just broke. He's broken. My favorite meme from a con- this congressman's prayer was this. If you end your prayer with amen and a woman, you're a moron. I love that. I hope the morons aren't offended, but I love that. See, we, we are theologically ignorant as a nation, and, and it shows we have surrendered too much ground in all areas of our lives, and it's time as Christ followers that we reclaim surrendered ground. Rob Hines says this. He says, before the church can have a great awakening, it might need an, alarming, an annoying alarm clock. Before the church can have a great awakening, it might need an annoying alarm clock. You know, I have an annoying alarm clock because that's the only way it'd wake me up. And I, I was going to set it, but it'd take me too much time to show y'all what it sounds like. I'll just give you a version of it. I mean, it's real annoying. I mean, just fingernails on the chalkboard annoying. That's the only way it wakes me up. I've decided that I'm going to be an annoying alarm clock. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to reclaim surrendered ground. And if, in order to do that, there's some things we need to do. The first thing we need to do is this. We need to realize we are at war with a clever enemy. He's no dummy. He's very clever. Paul, uh, excuse me, Peter one of, the, one of the disciples of Jesus in Jesus' little inner circle, the, Jesus, the one P, Jesus said on, on what, Peter, what you said on that, I'm going to build my church. The one who was not worthy, he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Savior did, so crucify me upside down. That Peter, he said this. Be alert and be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You ever watch National Geographic or the Discover Channel and watch how a lion traps and gets their, be- their food out of the herd? Have you ever watched it? You notice who they don't go for? You notice what they don't do? They don't run up into the middle of the herd. You notice that? You notice they don't go where there's a whole group of them around? You notice they don't go for the, the, the lead because a lot of other folks are right around and can see. A lot of other animals are right around and can see them. Who do they wait for? They wait for that animal to separate themselves from the rest of the herd and get by themselves and then they attack. It's what Satan wants to do with you. He wants to wait until you get in your weakened state. He wants to wait until you stop reading your Bible. He wants to make sure that you're not getting connected in a life group. He wants to make sure you're not getting connected at church, that your church worship is sporadic in, 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 in attendance, that you're not serving the Lord in any way. He wants to make sure that's going on because he knows when you're getting disconnected there, you're getting separated and further and further away from God. And the farther away from God you are, the easier target you are for attack. He's clever. 
He wants to attack you. Every area of your life, He wants to attack. You've heard me say it too many times, but you're going to hear it again. The devil is not your friend. He only wants your destruction. He's going to sneak up on you when you are the least prepared and he's going to attack you. He's going to look for these weaknesses in you and he's going to exploit them. He's going to tip you with things that look like they are good but that are destructive to you and he will constantly lie to you. Jesus was talking to his disciples one day and he was warning them. He was warning them about Satan. And notice what he said. John records his words of warning in John 8, 44, talking about Satan. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. See, the devil is going to tell us we can't win. The devil is going to tell us that we might as well just give up and not try to retake any surrendered ground. The devil is going to say that there is no use and that there is no hope. He's going to say the task is too big and y'all are too few and it's futile for you to even try. When he starts feeding you those lines, you remind him Jesus already told you exactly who he is, that he's a liar and that's not true. Jesus took 11 men and changed the world. Don't tell me. Don't tell me he can't use us. Listen, friends. You know why we're here hearing about the gospel today? It's because 11 men were faithful back then. Satan is going to tell you that there's nothing you can do so you you should just shut up and go along and not make any waves or call anybody out. But don't believe his lies. Listen, we need to realize we're we're at, at war with a clever enemy, but we also need to understand this. We can make a difference if we choose to. The primary problem with Christ followers' role today in changing the modern world is that most Christ followers no longer believe we are capable of accomplishing that change. There's a lot of, there's this false belief out there that is widely held by far too many Christ followers that the culture has become so powerful that we are simply incapable of transforming it. We've bought into Satan's lie that the culture is too negative and it's too strong to be transformed by God's truth. If Christ followers do not stand up and change the world, it will not change for the better. I've done a lot of reading recently, and Matthew Kelly, he writes this. He said, the future of Christianity and the world will rise or fall based upon the unconsidered possibility that the average person in the street is capable of collaborating with God To create holy moments on a daily basis. It is essential that we resist the temptation to seek worldly solutions to spiritual problems. Our problem in our nation is nothing to do with politics and everything to do with a spiritual war. You see, Christ followers need to wake up and we need to retake surrendered ground in the name of Jesus Christ. We need to choose to make a difference. And to do that, we need this. We need to realize it's been done before. The hardest thing to do are things that have never been done. You know why they're so difficult? Because they've never been done. You don't, you know, you figure out a point where you start, and then from that point on, once you finally figure out that, every point you do, every step you make, from that point on, you're guessing. 
You're just trying to figure it out. You're making mistakes. You're starting over. You're having to redo things. And and because it's never been done before, you don't know what to look for in the mistakes. That's not the situation we are in today. You see, if... This is not the first time that the world has been in the mess like it's in today. We are not dealing with anything new. The church was born into a volatile time where the teachings and the practices of the church were not accepted by the society it was in. Check this out. Listen. The government sought to destroy the church. Caesar had Christians. He, he had Christians. He had them brought into the arena to fight gladiators and to fight wild animals. He took some of them. He put them on stakes in his garden, cut their tongues out so he couldn't hear them yelling, and set them on fire so that they could play games up under them. Now somebody may say something negative on Facebook. Scares us to death. We may get canceled. Scares us to death. You're not facing having your tongue cut out, being stuck on a stake and hung over a garden. The government sought to destroy the church every way it could. The society sought to discredit the church and the people of the church, uh, these first century believers, they suffered persecution because they chose to believe in Jesus. Jesus. And even the religious people did everything in their power to shut down the church and the message of the saving grace of Jesus Christ and to keep it from reaching the rest of the world. Let me ask you a question. Who made sure Jesus got crucified? Thank you. The church did. The the religious people. The temple. The priests. They made sure Jesus got crucified. See, the early church faced what appeared to be insurmountable odds with the culture, with religion, and with the government all ganging up on them to stop it, and they all failed. You know how I know that? Because we're here today talking about it. Had they succeeded, you would have never heard about Jesus. You see, what? you know what the... Tra- Listen... You know what the strategy was for the early Christ followers? It's very simple. They were different. They they were different. They lived differently. They worked differently. They loved differently. They were different than anyone else around them. And people noticed. And they wanted to know about their difference. Why were they different? And they got a chance to tell people about Jesus. In the first century, if you were not among the elite and the powerful, you were treated as objects whose sole purpose was to fulfill the desires of the Roman Empire. It, is, it was extremely brutal. And it was in that dark climate, in that dark culture, that Christianity shone brightly. Again, Kelly writes this. The first Christians intrigued the people of their time with their selflessness in the midst of a culture where everybody seemed solely preoccupied with self-interest. The first Christians captured the imaginations of their age with their love. They took seriously Jesus' directive that his disciples would be known by their love for one another and their love for God others the first Christ followers you know what how many Bibles do you have you got one of these you got a few thousand unlimited number I got like two or three shelves of Bibles in my office early church had no Bibles we got a nice building here to meet in don't we Early church had no church buildings. 
You know what they had? They had God in themselves. God in each other. That's what they had. They had God in each other. And because they had God in each other and they didn't take the culture's word that they should shut up and sit down, because they didn't do that, we, are here, we heard about the gospel 2,000 years later. Listen, the first Christ followers differentiated themselves from the culture that they were in due to their difference. Today's Christ followers want to blend in. Blend in. We don't want to be different. And if we are going to reclaim surrendered ground, then it's vital that we as Christ followers stop blending in and start standing out. Our culture, it needs to see a decided difference between us and the world. And it's time for us to wake up and get in the fight. Have any of you heard this phrase? Maybe you've said it. I just wish Jesus would hurry up and come. Anybody said that? Am I by myself? I'm the only one? Oh, man. Y'all are a lot better than me. What about this other one? What about this other one? I just wish Jesus would change the world. Guess what? The truth is, he already has. He's already come. He's already changed the world. And he left Christ's followers here to continue what he started. He he hasn't stopped changing the world. We've stopped telling people about it. Look, he left us a mission. He left us a mission. Acts 1.8. Notice what Acts 1.8 says. Luke writes this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That was a commission given to them at that time. It's also a commission given to us in this time. We are to give a, a testimony, a witness of what Jesus has done everywhere we go. Jesus was not just telling them a geographical area. He was letting them know wherever you are. Tell people about me. It's our mission. Again, Kelly writes this. The heart of the matter is that most Christians don't actually believe we can change the world. It doesn't matter that the first Christians changed the world. Modern Christians don't actually believe they can do it. Can I ask you a bit? Well, I'm going to ask you a very... Straightforward question, whether you want me to or not. Do you believe that Christ can use us to change the world today? I can't answer that for you. Do you personally believe that Christ can use us to change the world today? Your answer to that question can be very clarifying about your faith in God. And if you believe Christ can use us to change the world today, then get in the fight. Listen, your team may win the game, but if you are not on the team you had nothing to do with them winning the game. It doesn't matter that you wore your, the, the jersey that you were wearing the last time they won the game. It doesn't matter that you have refused to wash your socks until they lose another game. It doesn't matter that you are sitting in the same chair, eating the same food at the same place, in the same way, wearing the same clothes, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and all of that together whenever they're playing. They're not depending on you to help them win their game. They don't even know you exist. You could not even watch the game and it wouldn't matter. You know how I know that? I haven't watched half the games of my team and they still won without me. I don't know how they did that. I've been needing to write the coach. I mean, I want you to think about that. Listen, we have, 
If you're not in the game, you're on the sidelines and you're contributing nothing. And we have been called not to stand on the sideline and cheer for others to do the work of changing the world. We are called to be in the fight and get in the game. See, Christianity has too many fans and not enough players. So if we're going to reclaim surrendered ground, then we need to get in the fight. And the last thing I want to tell you is this. If you want to get in the fight and you want to change this world, here's where you start. You need to pray and then you need to do what God is leading you to do. Talk to Him first. Change did not come in the first century because the first Christ followers gathered together in some room and stayed there and prayed. Change came because once they prayed, they went out and did what God told them to do. They went out and did what, God, what they felt led by God to do. And they were involved in all areas of society. They were telling the gospel to, to the poorest of the poor and to the kings. How do you know what God is leading you to do? I'm going to give you just a two-question check to know if you're doing what God's called on you to do, what God's leading you to do. First, is it in line with His Word? God is not going to lead you to do anything that contradicts what He says in His Word. Is it in line with His Word? Second, will it honor Him? That's your starting point. Is it in line with God's word and will it, will it honor him? That's it. See, Christ followers, we need to stop being silent and stand up and make a difference in this world by being different than the world. It is time to reclaim surrendered ground. We need to speak out in love about issues that you know violate God's principles and His teachings. God has revealed to us in His Word what His principles and His teachings are. He loves us too much to keep quiet about it. He's told us exactly what they are. He's already defined marriage. He's already defined sexuality. He's already defined gender. He's already commanded us to look out for widows and orphans. He's already told us to stand on His truth even if no one else does. He's told us to help those who are in need. He's told us to be His witnesses and to share the good news that He loves these folks and He wants a relationship with, him, with, them, with them. He, as Christ followers, we are to be the voice of those who have no voice like the unborn and like the elderly and like the persecuted. We are to be their voice. When any moral issue is being addressed in politics, then as Christ followers, we need to call our politicians about them. See, Christ followers need to represent Christ in all areas of our society. We are not called to be popular. We're called to be faithful. Oh, Pastor Jimmy, I'm only one person. What can I do? Well, you can start with by doing your part. It's not that complicated. Do your part. It doesn't, you're not called on to check on everybody else, make sure they're doing their part. You're called on to do your part. I'm called on to do my part. Don't let what you don't think you can do interfere with what you can do. Each one of us working together can change this world for Jesus Christ. I know you're thinking about calling your politician. What good is it going to do? I'm only one voice. Let me ask you something. If an if a, if a issue comes up that Christians should stand for, and it comes up, it's going to be voted on, which is ridiculous, but it happens. It happens all the time. And it's going to be voted on. 
You might think one voice is lost in the, in the crowd. What about 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 voices? You think they get lost in the crowd? You can be one of those. But you have to choose to. It's time for us to do our part. It is time for us to renew our commitment to walking with God. And for some, maybe in this room or watching online, it's time for you to start walking with God. It's time to start praying and asking God to lead us to what He wants us to do to help change the world. It's time to claim Reclaim surrendered ground. It's time to reclaim surrendered ground. Listen, here's my commitment. This is my commitment, and I want to invite you to join me in this. I won't back down. I won't give up. I won't give in. I will get in the fight. And by God's grace, I will make a difference for him. My question for you is, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to make that same commitment of I won't back down. I won't give up. I won't give in. I will get in the fight. And by God's grace, I will make a difference for him. Are you wanting to be popular or are you wanting to be faithful? Are you willing to make that stand? I am. I'm inviting you to join me. Will you pray with me? Lord, we've already talked to you today about how this world is in a mess. We've already talked to you today about how we need your help. But also today we've seen, Father, how we don't need to back down. We don't need to stand down. We need to stand up. We don't need to cower in fear, but we need to stand in your strength. We're not doing this battle on our own. You haven't sent us out there and wished us luck. You said, come on and go with me and let's go into this battle together. So, Father, I pray that we would do that. Pray that we wouldn't give up and we wouldn't back down and we wouldn't give in and we would make a stand and get in the fight. I pray, God, that we would reclaim surrendered ground. Maybe there's some, Father, that's in this room or watching online. They, they want to get on the team. They want to get in the fight. They want to make a difference. If that's who you are and you want to join the team and become a faithful Christ follower, the first step is giving your heart to Jesus. To do that, you can follow this very simple prayer. Just pray it just between you and God in your own words. And the first word to remind you of this prayer is, sorry, God, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I'm sorry I've rejected you up to this point. I'm sorry I hadn't been on your team. May my sins please come into my life and save me. And please become the Lord of my life. And the last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for becoming the Lord of my life. Thank you for not giving up on me. Father, for those who have prayed that prayer for the first time today in a minute, I pray that you would work in their lives in a very powerful way. Help them as they have joined your team today. Give them their marching orders. Give them their, their game plan that you have for them and help them, Father. Help them to focus on you. Father, for others who are already Christ followers, they may have given up too much ground. They've surrendered it to the enemy. They've backed down from taking a stand they need to take, and, and they have just surrendered too much. Father, I pray that you would strengthen them, us, strengthen us. Help us to retake surrendered ground, and help us to do it in the name of Jesus. Help us to stand for you, even if it appears we're standing alone.
each week this altar is going to be open for a time of prayer if you'd like for me to pray with you I'll be glad to do that simply get my attention if you don't want me to pray with you I won't bother you I'm comfortable praying with you if you're comfortable with me doing that I'm good with it you ready to reclaim some surrendered ground I know I am this altar there's plenty of room will you join me as we pray as we stand let's join in this song you are my joy you are my song you are the well the one I'm drawing from you are my refuge my whole life long would I go? Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, Your love defends me. Your love defends. Day, night after night, I will remember you're with me in this fight. Although the battle it rages on, the war is already won. I know the war is already won. Surely. Your love defends me, your love defends me, and when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me, your love defends me, we sing Soul. Your love defends me, your love defends me, and when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me, your love defends me, surely my God is the strength of my soul, your love defends me, your love defends me. Oh, I love that. that One line in there, I like that song, but one line in there, the battle is already won. It's already won. We share in the victory. I'm not hopeless, I'm hopeful coming into this year. Because I've already seen what Jesus can do. I've seen what He's done in history. I've seen how He has brought victory into the nations. And I know that we can reclaim surrendered ground here in our nation if we'll just choose to do that. If you're a first-timer here, if you've been here before and I hadn't met you, I would love to visit with you. I'll be just outside these doors to the left here. Exit the doors, hang on left, you'll see me. Drop by and see me. I'd love to visit with you. If you made a decision for Jesus, whether you're in this room or online, wherever you are, send us an email. Send me an email. It comes straight to me. It's in at woodbinechurch.org. I-A-M-I-N at woodbinechurch.org. Send it to me. Let's celebrate your good news of your receiving Christ. And let me know how I can help you with your next steps. Thank you so much for being here. Remember, let's go reclaim some surrendered ground. I want to turn it to Miss Brenda. She's going to close us out with prayer. Miss Brenda. Thank you, Pastor. I want to remind everybody, in a few moments, our leadership empowerment meeting is going to be here in this room rather than over in the uh, commons. We want to make sure you have plenty of room for social distancing. So kind of hang out. Food's out there ready for you. Candy, will you come on up? 
everybody. So kind of like uh, Jimmy's annoying alarm clock, I'm gonna be your constant annoying oil change light because I think that we forget about the maintenance that things need in our lives and what better way to reclaim some surrendered ground than to stand up and, and come to our, our marriage conference and reclaim your marriage for Christ and um, build a family that's still in love with Jesus. What better way to change the world? Thank you, Candy. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just don't let us ever forget that our voice is the voice of heaven. We know what you would say if you would be here. And so we have the power and ability to speak. Touch each and every person in this room. Allow whatever giftedness they have to be boldly in favor of what you would have said. Anoint them, love them, take care of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great one. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. 